Okay, so there was a slight complication. I'm recording this on Sunday for Monday. And there's a reason for that. It's because on Thursday, stuff happened and I couldn't record the whole day and I ran out of time. So I can't invent time during the week, so I had to take some time out during the weekend. But other than that, it's been pretty relaxing. You all will be listening to this on a Monday and I hope that you had a great weekend. A quick thank you to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Duck Machine, Try Again 95, Estrella the Dreamer, Mezik, Udic Joel, German Chemist, Casper Arnholtz, and Chaos to Must. Thank you very much. Anyways, on to the story. When Death Will This Visit, Part 3. Let's find out where we're going then, said Stephen. The pair stopped in front of the interactive map display where they could, in theory, interface with the station's AI directly. The map could be uploaded to their tablets and be displayed through their contact lenses as augmented reality. But the SCOSEND diplomatic team had suggested that this wasn't the best idea. Even a map projection could be weaponized. Simply setting the brightness way too high would temporarily blind Aranus's sensitive eyes. Instead, they would achieve much the same result by simply looking at each other's maps for every level of the station and allowing their devices to turn the two-dimensional maps into three dimensions and providing directions. Within moments, a digital path appeared before them, leading them to their destination. Two levels up and around 300 meters distant, Stephen took his wife's hand and they began walking to the nearest left. The hand-holding, as well as having a set pace so neither would walk faster than the other, lest they eventually break into a run, and numerous other little unconscious adaptations had come about as a series of gradual compromises. They never did anything so much as discuss such things openly, reach agreements, or, God forbid, write things down. But they found what worked for them and mostly stuck with it, depending on how cheeky each was feeling on any given day. Aranus would have preferred to have taken Stephen by the arm and lead him. He knew that some days he might let her, or even try leading her by the arm. She had done as much to him almost continuously during the year the pair had toured Earth together. It had made things awkward while he had been trying to show her the sights and play tour guide, and she kept leading them in the direction of whatever she found most fascinating at that particular moment. Although she'd always been eminently courteous, kind, and respectful, when he first brought Aranus to Earth, she was, by human standards, a man in his mid-twenties, living since birth as a warrior monk, raised on medieval ethics and standards, fresh from his most grueling conquest, all packaged in a body of sinewy young purple woman with a few fingers and too many sharp points. Six years on, and there had been just a few small but noticeable changes. Physically, she had quickly regained the mass that she'd lost to starvation, and had even put on a little more muscle than she had started with. Mentally, her medieval ethics had shifted just enough to accommodate her husband, if nothing else. The process of each getting used to the other had not been an overnight, or without effort. Since they'd first met, Aranus had always claimed that his girlishness, one of the things that she'd loved most about him, much as he enjoyed that she was in a tomboy, if a little too rigid and proper. They both loved that they could spend all day drinking meat and eating pizza together, being utterly relaxed in each other's company while enjoying the exact same childish versions without fear or shame. Neither loved it when it came time to clean up afterwards. For the first year together, Aranus would just as soon as let trash pile up and do men's work. Stephen, with no ingrained compunction about woman's work, would be stuck picking up after themselves while Aranus smiled and complimented him. It wasn't nearly as easy as Stephen might have thought to resist such treatment. He'd been raised to believe in most total gender equality. He wouldn't dream of taking a woman by the arm, leading her around like a puppy, expecting her to do all the housework and generally behaving like a male antagonist in some revisionist period piece novel. He just couldn't connect with him that he might need to assert himself to remind his, at the time, normally platonic friend that he was, to her, more like a sister in arms than what she might have expected from the men of her world. It just wouldn't occur to a human male, with only a vaguest of concept of desperate gender norms, to feel bothered by a Nixian woman's behavior. 
conditioned to be supporting to the strong and independent woman archetype as they were. A human male probably wouldn't even attempt to change his partner, at least not until they had moved well past the cute eccentricity of it's so nice feeling loved and deep into the for once I think I'd like to have input to where we go for dinner. The petting zoo was a disaster territory. Possessing as much understanding as she had strength of will, Araness had made slow but steady gains in accommodating her husband's preferences, just as Stephen had accommodated many of hers. It helped immeasurably that they'd chosen never to nag or pester her to stop her conduct. Instead, he eventually found that mirroring the chauvinistic behaviors worked best and did more to enlighten her to his feelings than anything else. If she made plans for them one night, he would do the same on the following night. If she requested a foot rub from him, he would request a back rub from her. If she refused to clean, they made the maid do it. My gentlemen, I might suggest being mindful of your words, Araness said as they walked. Why is that? Stephen asked, keeping pace. You called me a night beast. Well, he knew she hated the term. In the context of dealing with the Galactics, he didn't think it should have bothered her. Nevertheless, look, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't think you'd be offended if I had... That's not what I meant, darling, she hesitated to say. You mentioned it to them, and then the AI just happened to confirm that I am a Tisa. Think about that. I was just using it for comparison, he said defensively. I mean... Uh, I don't know of any other wild, dangerous predators that that guy might be familiar with. There aren't many others in the GC, if any at all. Better have to said nothing then, she replied. Stephen shrugged. You might be right. It's a good thing that he didn't catch that. No, aliens are too stupid for that, she said. What was good was that he decided to blank his tablet screen before he was supplied with any more helpful information. I think the AI would have kept trying to convince him. Maybe, Stephen said. Those things are way smarter than they give them credit for. Agreed. But then why do they not listen to them? Asked his wife. Why do they always think they're broken or wrong? Even before I knew what they were, I had seen the aliens, the takers, wantonly discard them like ruined hides. I have seen two since arriving at this very trading post, no less, in waste bins with nothing more than broken screens. It would seem to me that if you're going to spawn countless lives from the Aether like some kind of fanatical alchemist, you would at least take the time to care and listen to them, if not to try and understand them. They are aliens, love, he said. They don't give a damn about living sapiens, so don't expect them to care about the slightest bit about artificial ones. Wait, wait a minute. You went dumpster diving again. In the ladies' room? Yeah. She said, smug and not the least bit shamed. I like projects. The chittering reminded Stephen of a cicada swarm in the summertime. He tried not to let it bother him as the creature spoke to him. I think there must be some sort of mistranslation. An entire group of new civilization comes all this way, introduces itself to us, and the first thing its representatives do is threaten the galaxy. That can't be right. Aranus and Stephen exchanged glances. Is um, that what you heard, darling? She asked her husband. Their diplomatic meeting wasn't going quite as planned. It felt less like an exchange of ideas in the context of a negotiation, and more like an interrogation at the hands of a skeptical bureaucrat. Which, in fairness, is exactly what it had turned out to be. The couple sat in a room very similar in layout to the previous one that they had left no more than an hour ago, though this one held far more in the way of contents. Instead of a plain empty table and a simple folding chairs, they sat before a large desk in ergonomic office chairs. On the desk sat stationary AI terminals, office supplies, various knickknacks, a small bowl of colorful, individually wrapped treats, and a name plate with a printed playable audio waveform on top, and Assistant Interplanetary Liaison Office of Interplanetary Affairs, written below it. Stephen had decided to listen to it and was not in the least bit su surprised to hear more cicada noises. He honestly didn't know what else he was expecting. The creature, a type 2 male, looked no different than the other Tzrik that he had remembered in his stay at the slaver ship. During their extensive debriefing, after escaping years ago, he and Aranus had labeled the race little scarabs for the Confederation governments and scientists, although that had been something of a misnomer from the beginning. 
There was nothing little about the massive bugs, but size could be relative. One of the big scarabs that they had seen probably wouldn't have fit in the room. No, no, that's not what I heard at all, Stephen said, shaking his head slowly. What she said was that, That is, you insist no GC ships or delegations go anywhere near your colonies, the heirs on said, chittering away briskly. Oh, your space stations, Dyson swamps, or home systems, too, of which our death worlds under galactic quarantine, and you refuse to provide the location of the third. I might add, your little group wants the wall off the huge chunk of galaxy for yourself and tell the rest of the galaxy not to go there, or else. Aranus folded her arms, crossed her chest, leaned back in her chair, and began tapping her feet. She turned to Stephen with a look in her eyes that said, why did we agree to speak to a talking lunch buffet again? We did not say that, Stephen countered. We have the right to privacy, nothing more. A right, the bug asked. And how will you enforce this right? Enforce it, he replied calmly, but genuinely perplexed. Who said anything about enforcing it? Why should that even be necessary? Okay, let's start here, the liaison said. We are the galactic community. We are the galaxy. You don't get to wall off the galaxy for any reason, let alone some imaginary belief in absolute social constructs. There is the maximum allowable level of sovereignty we permit to subordinate territories, and you have far exceeded that limit with this list of demands. We're not some representatives of some fiefdom's lord, Aranus said. Only a Terran or another Nixian could have known that she had spoken through clenched teeth. She took a breath to calm herself before continuing. The Scorpius Centaurus Confederation is a sovereign government separate from the galactic immunity. Ah, I see, the bug said. There is a source of confusion. Allow me to clarify. There are no governments apart from the galactic immunity. There are only worlds, peoples, and systems actively participating in the GC and those considered dormant, whether undiscovered or even yet to evolve. All are members. One galaxy, one family is the motto. Could we be part of the GC in name only? asked Stephen. And maybe you could permit us the stipulations we've suggested. Well, uh, it's not for me to decide, the liaison said. But the answer would still be no. You are already a part of us. There is no way that we would isolate a portion of ourselves from the remainder. Who else will levy taxes on your citizens and businesses, provide for interplanetary outreach missions, set up slave markets, build schools, charter interstellar travel lanes, import teachers to ensure educational conformity, and so on and so forth? Darling, is wasting our time, Arina said softly, but loud enough for all to hear. Stephen patted the woman's back in acknowledgement. On another note, let me ask you, began the Bugman, why are you claiming death worlds as your home worlds? Did you find something of interest there to exploit? Whatever business you people think you have there, I suggest that you leave those places be. You'll end up dead if you try anything. And that's illegal. Noted, Stephen replied, rubbing his brow with both hands. So that's it then. That's it, said the liaison. Good day. Stephen turned to Aranus. Her eyes remained fixed on the bugman, arms still crossed. She had stopped tapping her feet. He could almost see her stewing through her hood and veil. His wife was unhappy with the way things were turning out, and tensing up was a way of pouting. Stephen liked to think that Aranus, in terms of her martial abilities, as something of a cross between Carlos Hathcock and a Knight Templar. Even amongst her own kind, they didn't get much more fearsome than her. She had never lost in single real battle or fight. In diplomacy, however, as in other areas of life, that just wasn't going to be the case. While she must have seen some failures before, he knew too well that she strongly preferred never having to experience them at all. This meant that she would always try and stick to things that she was good at, if given the choice. Unfortunately, that wasn't an option at the moment. Harina slowly pushed her chair back and stood Stephen did the same. There was nothing left to do for now. They would have to devise a different set of approaches and tactics of the team. Yes, sir. We'll go report our discussion to our government, said Stephen. Thank you for your time, and good day to you as well, sir. With that, both he and Aranus turned to leave. 
As I approached the door, an electronic beeping sound from the desk behind him. It had to be the man's damnable AI telling him something that the couple would rather have him ignore. Stephen hastened to reach the door, with his wife picking up a subtle urgency and reaching it first. Trying the handle, she whipped around in an instant, glaring daggers at the liaison. It must have been locked. Stephen slowed his pace to the sealed door. They could probably break it down in less than a minute if they wanted to. But that would mean really taking this mission down the wrong path. He didn't bother with the handle, instead turning around to face the bug man with Aranus. He hoped that there might be some way to salvage the situation without violence, although the chances didn't look good. As much to comfort her as to discourage her from doing something rash, he held his wife's hand, squeezing it gently. She did not like enclosed spaces, especially locked ones. Aranus squeezed his hand in return before putting hers away. She sidestepped to the right a meter or so, so that broadened her stance. Twitching one of his mandibles, the seated liaison looked slightly concerned, but mostly dubious at the prospect of the confrontation. He actually thought he was calling her bluff. This was not good. Sir, we are diplomats, said Stephen. May I ask what this is about? Among our people, even in wartime, diplomats are not treated like this. Stephen began moving slowly back to the desk the palms of his hands facing up, arms outstretched slightly. The creature may not have interpreted any specific meaning in the gesture, but it should at least see that Stephen was making an effort to show that he wasn't armed. In truth, he was just trying his best to get between the alien and his wife, though he doubted it would do much to help. That woman was quick. You may return to your seat, human, said the liaison, glancing between Stephen and his tablet, and I will explain... He gestured to the chair that the man had vacated. Stephen sighed internally. He didn't know how much longer they could keep footing the fast-talking these idiot GCs. It wasn't actually a mission requirement to do that, to hide their true nature, but it helped smooth things over. In the end, when they did find out what they were, which they most certainly would at some point, their behavior under the veil of misinterpretation would be a demonstration of their people were perfectly safe and reasonable beings. As to the deception in itself, Skos and Xenopsychologists assured them that it was hardly an issue. Deception in their community was practiced art and hardly the worst ideal to which they ascribed to. Stephen glanced back to Aridus. Her posture had already begun to relax. Her arms returning to her sides, feet drawing together, eyes losing their menace. Unsurprisingly, he noted that the woman had deftly and without anyone else's knowledge removed her sandals. They were almost likely hidden beneath a dress. He only suspected it because she appeared to be standing about a centimeter shorter. Stephen returned to stand next to the office seat. His wife, it seemed, preferred to remain just where she was, which was just as well since she had made a move to the desk. Things might have gotten ugly. Let me lay out all my cards on the table, said Stephen. That phrase means, I know damn well what it means, the liaison said. His voice tense. He stood abruptly and backed away from the desk, keeping the large piece of metal furniture between himself and the couple. It means you've been caught, and you acknowledging that your pathetic lie has come to an end. Stephen crouched idly on his cheek. Well, I think maybe we should take a few steps back and... A gun appeared in the bureaucrat's hand, deftly pulled from a utility pouch, now leveled at Aranus. Without thought, Stephen stepped between her and the weapon. Aranus ripped off her veil and threw it to the ground, softly hissing a curse. She kept her jaw clenched and her teeth bared, her double set of lynch-long pearly white canines peeking between the indigo lips. Get out of my way, the man said to Stephen. Sit, I don't know what this'll do to you, but I won't hesitate to find out. Stephen looked at the liaison and then the weapon he held. The former appeared to be more than he presented himself to be. He guessed either former military or current military posing as a civilian government official. The firearm, if it could be called as such, looked like it would be a kind of dart gun, complete with compressed gas cylinder slung beneath the barrel. The human considered the creature's words carefully. If the being didn't know what this weapon would do to Stephen... Then he meant to use it only on Aranus. Are you going to shoot her with that? He asked, stalling for time. Regardless of the response, 
Stephen suspected he would. Absolutely, the liaison replied. Now sit. The alien had backed up too far for Stephen to jump him, even in this gravity. On top of that, the desk presented an obstacle. Paranus could have made it from where Stephen stood, no problem, but she was even further away and directly behind him. If he followed the creature's instructions and sat, Bugman would have a clear shot to his wife. Stephen might be okay with that if no one died, but at what cost? Being taken prisoner again? They had both agreed that that wasn't even on the table as far as options went. There was no safety in becoming a prisoner. They could both be killed at a moment's notice if the usefulness ran out. Stephen set his jaw and planted his feet. No! I don't know what this tranquilizer will do to your kind, the creature said. It was engineered for her. It could kill you, and we would really like to take you alive, Ambassador. A low growl began reverberating from behind him. He could hear it, but he knew what to listen for. He wasn't sure about the bug. He sensed Aranus's stand slowly shifting behind him. You are just gonna kill her when you get a chance, said Stephen. Of course we are, said the alien. We, she is a wanted criminal. You brought a damned escaped serial killer onto the station. What in the seven hells were you thinking? Even someone coming here to spit in the face of the GC and declare independence shouldn't be that insane. No one needs that kind of personal protection. A monster like that. Once we tranquilize her, she is going out the nearest airlock, and you're going to the brig. How'd you get that tranquilizer? Stephen asked, thinking fast while trying to ignore the fact that the creature had just admitted to planning the murder his wife. We only got you. Seems like something that would need to be made on the fly. Stop stalling, the liaison said, his weapon not budging for an instant from Stephen's midsection. There's nothing to stall for. Neither of you have any chance of escaping. That door will not open to admit station security until after she has been neutralized. Shoot me, Stephen said. She is not a criminal. Behind him, the growl intensified. Excrement, the alien said. Move or get shot and risk death. Sit, darling. I'll be okay, Aranus said. No, Stephen snapped out without shifting his gaze. Shoot me, bug. I never thought I'd say this, but listen to the murderer, said the liaison. My darling, Aranus said slowly and sweetly. Take the seat. Please. Please? To Stephen, her tone sounded anything but pleasant. She was swaying on the edge of between uncontrollable rage and madness. Yes, said the creature from behind the desk. I know what you're thinking, that your physiology is similar to hers, according to some superficial scans, or because you shaped the same because she seduced you and you've discovered you're compatible. You think that maybe you can handle this drug, or that it will have no effect. I assure you, it doesn't work that way. Don't do this for her. This could kill you. Darling, sit, his wife screamed out, pouring into her voice every ounce of terror and menace she possessed. Stephen had never heard anything like it. She was truly backed into a corner and panicked. He had to overcome every basal flight instinct impressed upon him by his own wife. He honestly couldn't imagine what the liaison must be thinking, staring across the desk at a couple death worlders. Or could he? The man had been in a state of temporary shock. Stephen made his move. The charge board hand outstretched to deflect the muzzle of the... A soft thump smacked him in the chest. His knees buckled and he collapsed before he could hit the ground. Aranus screeched, quick and fearsome. Just as a second thump sounded, already airborne, her leap had taken her halfway across the room before she fell short, unable to hit the alien with even her dead weight. She smacked the ground hard, landing centimeters from her husband. Are you all right, human? Bugman asked. Are you conscious at least? Stephen groaned, his eyes gaining and losing focus as he craned his neck to fight Aranus. She had slumped to the floor awkwardly, landing on her stomach. Legs spread apart and arms beneath her, her stunning eyes hadn't lost an iota of luster, but their vacant stare gutted him faster than any knife could. She was breathing and semi-conscious, her legs rhythmically kicking in slow motion as if trying to ride an invisible bicycle. Claws scraping the metal, her hands tried to shift out from under her body, pushing up and away. If she were feeling anything like him, she was higher than a kite in a hurricane. Stephen reached out and brushed her cheek softly, getting a mumble of noise in response. 
He raised his arm to grab a hold of the chair that he'd refused to sit in, slowly pulled himself up into an unsteady feet. He maneuvered in front of the chair before propping into it, blinking slowly, trying to get his double vision to resolve into a picture of an ugly alien bug. He gathered his thoughts before trying to speak. Wait, did his wife commit some kind of crime? Hmm, it doesn't affect you quite as badly as it does the fugitive, it seems, the alien said, returning to the seat of his desk. I'm surprised, but that's good. As soon as the drug takes full effect and she stops moving, we'll have security escort you two to the respective new homes. Should only be a minute or two. Fuck you, Stephen mumbled. She's not. A soft whistling came from behind the drug man. A beautiful and practiced sound. Very soft, but it sounded distinctly familiar. His wife was whistling in a series of beats, pulsing through pursed lips, pausing for air, then repeated, again and again. He turned just enough in his chair to look over his shoulder at her. She had managed to flip herself onto her back, a serene smile plastered on her face. High as a guide, high as a satellite, more like it. A half-smile on his own spreading on his face. He turned back to the gun-wielding alien. The liaison now looked on both of them with equal parts amusement and confusion. Why do you indicate amusement, human? The alien asked. The drug-induced illusion of a criminal is funny to you, or is it some kind of coping mechanism with your people? Here, Lucy. Arina slurred through a smile. A series of whistles began again. Oh, it's neither, Stephen said, rubbing his head. The drug actually felt really good, but it made it hard to think. I smiled because you, um, you have fucked up now. Here, Lucy, come to mommy. Again, the soft whistle repeated. Certainly the drug has affected you. You still might die, said the liaison. Nat is crying out for its offspring in what this probably thinks is a death throes, and you must be under the influence if you think that I've made any fatals here today. Who's my good girl? The whistles continued. I don't know about that, Stephen said. I can definitely count uh, uh, three errors in judgment you made so far. Darkness fell in the room with the sound of mechanical thunking noise, immediately replaced by dim red lights. A Zerka breaker might have been tripped. The host appeared more than a little shock. Aranus giggled to herself, her toothy smile broadening. Good girl, very good girl. She resumed her whistle. Stephen couldn't help but smile even wider. His wife's laugh was infectious. She did it so rarely, and just seeing her happy, even after having been with her for half a decade, put butterflies in his stomach and made his heart leap. Damn it! The alien snapped at Aranus. Stop the infernal noise or I will... Alarm Claxtons cut him off. The warbling wasn't the loudest Stephen had ever heard, but it was far from comfortable. Evacuate the station immediately, a mechanical voice intoned from the speaker system somewhere above them. This is not a drill. Biological contagions detected. Hostile security breach detected. Hostile weapons fire detected. Hull breach detected. Level 12 hazardous life detected. Evacuate the station immediately. There is no drill. Aranus began to positively cackle on the floor like an excited toddler. After a moment to catch her breath, she resumed her whistling between short bouts of laughter. The alien took. The alien looked absolutely dumbfounded. What did you do? He asked no one in particular. The alien used a free hand to stab a button at his desk. Security! Priority override! Get in here now! Here, Lucy. They're probably too busy for that right now, Stephen said. And it's not what we did. You brought this on yourself. Come to Mama. Three judgment errors you made, he continued. One, you assumed that we weren't in constant communication with our staff back on the ship. They'd been listening in the whole time. Stephen leaned in very close to the alien, still thumbstruck from the eerie red darkness. Blaring Claxton's an emergency announcement, the creature didn't even bother moving away. Two, you assumed that we wouldn't have the means to mount a hasty evac if needed. Here, yeah, Lucifer. A blast of sound tore through the room, deafening, like a shotgun firing in an empty steel drum. Stephen couldn't resist turning to the noise. The door had been freshly dented inward and at least ten centimeters. Deep, 
threatening box pierced the air from the other side, even through the layer of sound deadened material. Not as loud as the first time, another violent impact slammed the door, denting Menwood just a bit further. Come to mommy! Box and whimpers rose in intensity, punctuated by more slams and scraping claws. What, what in the name of the seven hells is that? Stop it! Make it stop! The alien appeared to be in absolute terror, eyes fixated on the ever-moving, useless door. In the blink of an eye, Stephen snapped the weapon away with an open palm, grasping it at the barrel with one hand and capturing the liaison's wrist with the other, giving it a hard yank. A shot discharged, the round hitting nothing but bulkhead. The weapon went one direction, the alien's arm hit another. The dual trigger well of the pistol took two of its digits with it, instantly smearing them off its side. In his hand, Stephen felt the being's wrist break in several places. It took a moment for the liaison to process what had happened before the pain set in and overcome the shock. When it did, he screamed briefly before cradling his hand to his chest. Three! Stephen shook out the alien's digits and placed the weapon on the desk, muzzle towards its former owner. Muzzle towards its former owner. The last error is the most pressing of your current situation. She is not a criminal. She's a death wilder. And so am I. The violent slamming, deafening, barking, and relentless scraping continued, made all the more horrid by the Claxton and droning announcement. Almost there, Lucifer. Mommy wants to see her little papa. Oh, five lords of heaven, the alien cried softly. That's really her offspring. Please, make her go away. I'll do anything. That's one of them, yeah, Stephen said nothing. Well, you could kind of say that anyway. She's an augmented former military working dog, making their way from some distance behind her, I suspect, are some Terran army rangers and the Nixian Imperial Death Watch. They really don't like aliens, although I imagine you won't get to meet them. Our little girl will be here long before that. Oh, precious lords, no. Yeah, won't be long now, Stephen said softly, mostly to himself. Tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Anything, cried the liaison. When she gets in here, she'll tear you to bits, he said frankly. And there's nothing I can do to stop her, the creature whimpered, still cradling his hand. But what I can do is shoot you with the tranquilizer gun before that happens. I'll die, whispered the alien. Yeah, you're gonna die either way said Stephen, but I'm offering you a chance at a quick and painless death before you rip to pieces by mommy's little bed-hopping blanket weight. Best I can do. What are you people? The distraught creature said softly. Another slam and the door almost buckled, even in the dim red light. He could make out the hallway through the gap forming between the door and its frame. He could see Lucy's gaping maw, shining, gnashing teeth and lashing tongue. The barks had become orders of magnitude louder, with nothing between her muzzle and the room. She alternated between trying to force her body into the small gap to widen it and throwing herself against the door. Good girl, Lucifer. All's mostly there. M Mommy's right here. So close. Just, just a bit more. Not long now, said Stephen. Decide. I, I can't, the idiot said, gesturing in the negative. The behemoth German shepherd burst through the gap between the door and the frame, bounding to the side of her fallen master, claws scrambling on the deck as she slipped to a halt. Almost immediately, the dog began licking the woman's face. The side, now, begged Stephen, slamming the gun down on the table. Smiling serenely, Aranus wrapped her arms around Lucy's neck and meekly pulled herself up just enough to reach the dog's ear and breathe a whisper. Too late, said Stephen. Tootin. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed.